All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Marlin. I'm a faculty member in computer science at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and associate director of the Massachusetts AI and Technology Center for Connected Care in Aging and Alzheimer's Disease, or MassAITC. And I'll be hosting today's webinar. Uh, for those of you who are joining for the first time, MassAITC is an NIA funded center focused on technologies for supporting aging and ADRD care in the at home setting. Today's webinar is the fourth in a series of technology focused talks hosted by MassAITC. Um, if you missed any of the prior talks, we'll get video links in the chat for you momentarily, so you can check those out uh, at a later date. Um, the next Mass AATC webinar will be a panel discussion focused on digital measurement of functional health that is scheduled for Tuesday, November 28th at 3 p.m. Eastern. And we'll get a registration link into the chat for that webinar as well, uh, for those of you who uh, would like to register. Um, today's talk will be given by Professor Santosh Kumar. Uh, Professor Kumar is the Lil Lillian and Maury Moss Chair of Excellence in Computer Science at the University of Memphis, um, where he directs the NIH-funded Mobile Health Biotechnology Resource Center, uh, the MDOT Center. Um, his research team works on the development of wearable AI for sensor-triggered mHealth interventions. <clears throat> Professor Kumar has also worked on a wide array of mHealth detection problems, including detecting stress, smoking, craving, and drug use. Um, in today's talk, Professor Kumar will describe challenges and opportunities in the detection of stress from wearable devices. Um, in terms of connections of this work to Mass AITC, um, as people are likely aware, stress is a significant issue for caregivers of people with Alzheimer's. Uh, 2014 study cited by the Alzheimer's Association found that 60% of family caregivers rate the emotional stress of caregiving as high or very high. So unobtrusive approaches to continuous stress assessment of the kind that Professor Kumar will describe have many possible applications for caregivers, ranging from improved self-monitoring to tailoring of adaptive interventions. In terms of logistics for the webinar, please note that this talk is being recorded. Uh, Professor Kumar is happy to take questions throughout the talk. Um, if you have a question during the talk, please raise your hand uh, using the raise hand function in Zoom um, and we will call on you. Um, we'll also have time reserved for Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, with that, I will turn the proceedings over to Professor Kumar. So, Santos, thank you again for speaking with us today. Um, go ahead when you are ready. Thank you. And uh, this, uh, this was uh, uh, very nice of you. Uh, extremely kind introduction, uh, very generous. Uh, I'd like to thank you, uh, Mithesh, Deepak, and everyone at the center for giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, the stress and the journey for its automated detection so far. And um, I'm looking forward to having a conversation uh, by this talk. And so please feel free to chime in and, uh, and let's see where, where this goes. So, uh, <clears throat> so before proceeding, I would like to thank our sponsors, both NIH and NSF, uh, in particular NIBIB, that is the host of our, our MDOT Center. I would also like to declare a, a friend um, that uh, I'm also, uh, I have some stake as well as the management roles in the Q's Hub, which is a, a public benefit corporation started out of the work done uh, at the centers, uh, this and before it. Okay, so, so uh, first, a very brief introduction to the MDOT Center. So the MDOT Center's uh, charter is to develop the science and the tools necessary for the research community to design, uh, optimize, and deliver personalized in I mean, uh, mHealth interventions that are personalized to each individual's current state, their current context, the moment in time, and that are engaging in the long term. So it consists of uh, three technology research and development components. First one uh, analyzes the data collected in the studies to find patterns in the time series data, the patterns that can, uh, that can help identify uh, ways to as continuously estimate risk for different uh, health issues or adverse events, and then to uh, find for uh, for each moment, what the driving risk factors are. If we have both of these, then they can be used in mHealth interventions, both to decide when to deliver interventions and how to optimize the content for the intervention to be delivered in the moment in order to maximize the efficacy. The second TRD 
uh, takes each of these uh, triggers and the characterization of the risk factors. And it develops reinforcement learning algorithms to personalize these interventions to find the components of uh, both the content uh, as well as the triggers that will uh, result in the maximum efficacy and long-term engagement of the participant. The challenges are that on each part on each individual, the data collected is pretty small and given the wide between person variability, the, I mean, the, uh, the challenges are pretty steep in being able to optimize or personalize to each individual by uh, with limited opportunities to use data from others uh, because no two participants are alike. Then the, I mean, once we have these interventions, uh, they can have an effect only when we can deploy them. And so for deploy uh, for uh, for uh, delivery of these interventions or their implementation on real devices, there are several challenges that our third TRD, which is Technology Research and Development Project, deals with. First is implementing the detection of various states in real time on wearable devices and uh, finding ways to make them battery efficient. And second issue is that of uh, uh, ensuring that the privacy of the individuals are managed or uh, <clears throat> via appropriate control given back to users or participants. Uh, the, these advancements in terms of being able to infer new states of users from data or from sensors that was deployed for another purpose uh, increases the utility of these wearable devices for improvement in health and well-being monitoring. And, uh, but at the same time, it also raises issues with respect to how much it uh, can be learned about an individual in their natural environment on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. And therefore, privacy management becomes critical as well. <clears throat> so in rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on stress. So stress uh, emerged to, I mean, uh, for, to keep us alive. Uh, this still is the case in animals. I mean, so in this case, lion chasing a zebra. Stress is what can help uh, provide energy to zebra to escape and, and still live. And at the same time, if we look at the predator uh, lion, for lion as well, this stress is necessary for the lion to get that extra energy to catch the prey in the absence of which the lion's life will be in danger. So for both of them, in this case, the stress is necessary. And we humans were also like that at some point in time, maybe how, I mean, a few, several thousand or, 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 or millions of years ago. So, but things have changed. Now we, we don't have this immediate threat to our lives. But so we do have a stress. Uh, if we are a researcher, when we are trying to race against the deadline to submit a proposal, submit a paper, uh, I mean, or a student taking an exam, uh, then we do need that stress that helps give the extra energy to meet the demands of job or to help improve the performance in the moment. So, so there is some optimal level. Uh, stress at some points in time are useful, necessary to keep us productive. And, uh, <clears throat> but then too much or excessive stress or repeated stress that can lead to exhaustion. And if it continues, uh, then it can lead to burnout. If we look at our modern lives, uh, there are many sources of stress. If you pause for a moment, uh, those on the call, or if you are viewing this video later on, what are the major sources of stress in your respective lives? So think about it uh, for a moment. Here, I mean, we, uh, I mean uh, uh, I've shown only some of them. So, uh, so now switching, uh, switching our hat from being an individual, thinking about what stresses us. Now, if we put the hat of a scientist, then uh, we know that, uh, I mean, like. Chronic diseases uh, cause I mean, are like uh, are the major drivers of healthcare cost uh, because people are living longer. The healthcare has gotten better, right? 
<clears throat> now for behind the, each of this chronic diseases, the risk factors are like addictive behaviors, diet, I mean, uh, diet or physical inactivity, and then physiolog I mean, physiologically uh, cholesterol or blood pressure and so on. Interestingly, stress impacts each of these factors. That's how central of a role stress has. So given its, uh, gi uh, I mean, given its central role in each of these, there have been some estimates. And uh, as per the current estimate, uh, it, it is known to cost about $1.6 trillion each year in the world. So that's how costly excessive stress is. So uh, I mean, now we turn to, I, I mean, what, ha what has the scientific community and the industry been doing about it? So, so if we want to think about automated detection of stress, it's useful to take an analogy to automated detection of physical activity. Maybe two decades ago, we were in the same state for physical activity. There were a few devices out there that, was, that were trying to detect uh, physical activity. Even, I mean, where to place it on the arm, in the pocket, on the belt, I mean, it was not known. Uh, but today, physical activity is taken for granted. There are devices, conveniently wearable, wearable devices that do uh, track our physical activity. If we think about a step counting, there are about, I mean, 14,000, 15,000 assessments that happen per day to detect whether we have a step or not. And uh, I mean, it's uh, it has been shown that it's they have about 3% error rate, so about 400 uh, steps of error. Given that an average American walks about 5,000 steps per day, I mean, 432 steps is less than 10% of the true positives. So true positives are 5,000 per day. And I mean, so the so then the error is limited to less than 10% of true positives. So it is a usable system. I mean, largely people accept it. We still want to improve this further, but it's accepted that this is usable in real life. Now, how many people want to use it? I mean, that's a different matter, but it has already helped uh, in, in a lot of different kinds of research to figure out as to how much physical activity people should be doing and uh, into some intervention systems that are showing that those who do track their activity are able to walk, uh, I mean, or have, have more steps uh, I mean, uh, on average and perhaps push them above the, above the edge, which is like, I mean, if you have more than 6,000 steps per day, then the risk of various diseases goes down as was recently shown. So that's the state uh, with respect to a step detection. Now let's turn to a, to a stress detection. In a stress detection, if we monitor a person uh, every minute to say whether they are stressed or not stressed, we have all thousand assessments per day. How many times people have stress events per day? Uh, the estimates vary, but you, I mean, if we assume about one to two true events per day, then to have similar less than 10% of true positive, uh, so false positive being less than 10% uh, of true positives, we need 0.1 false positives per day, which translates to about 0 0.0001 false positive rate. So, I mean, so if we think in terms of how many nines, so it's like four nines. So, if, uh, <clears throat> And uh, let's say if we if we think um, not one uh, stress events per day, if two or three, it only changes the constant, doesn't change the magnitude. So where are we today in terms of the stress detection? So uh, recent works on some open lab data sets, they have been able to show that they can achieve an F1 score of about 0.96, leave one subject out. And then, uh, I mean, if we, uh, so that's if you use every, all the measurements, ECG, I mean, uh, skin uh, conductance, extrameter, respiration, temperature. If you use only PPG, it still is about 0.95 or, or, or so, uh, about 0.96. So, but, uh, I mean, so that's using the label that which participants were in, I mean, uh, at which of the data corresponds to you are participants undergoing a stress session. And this is really, really reusing the same data a lot of times with two second sliding window because there is a small amount of data and you want to enlarge it as much as possible in order to have uh, complex models uh, be applicable to it. 
So if we think about uh, uh, think about the uh, self report, so then the si a similar lab study, but instead of using the time when the data corresponds to someone being in the stress session or not, if we ask them how stressed they were just after the uh, after the the stress event or after the stress session then uh, they will they will rate their stress on some scale and if we uh, if uh, when it when the similar model was compared with that then the f1 score score was about 0. 0. 0.7 so if some whether somebody is stressed or not i mean what do you take as the ground truth and that's still debatable if we have, I mean, if we have validated stressors like public speaking, mental arithmetic, should we treat the person as a stress irrespective of what they say in their self-report? Or do we trust their, uh, trust their self-report irrespective of what they have been through? So now let's go out to the field. So there were, there have been several studies, a little larger scale um, with about 500 plus participants. And, and then, uh, so, and then, uh, so in these studies, after the data was collected, this time self reports of uh, whether you, how, I mean, on a scale of five as to how stressed they were, the F1 score, the best that could be obtained with post processing of the data was about 0 0.42, a little mar marginally better than the baseline of 0.36. On some people, it works better than others. So there were about 18% of the participants on whom the phone score was more than 0.66. Now, if we think about real-time assessment of stress and in real life, rather than taking the data and building a model, <clears throat> then there are some wearable devices that have a stress assessment happening in real time. So in, in this study, there were again about 600 participants who provided a stress rating once a day. And this time, uh, I mean, the stress rating from this Garmin watch was, uh, was used to compare and the best correlation they could find was zero. So, <clears throat> and then they, they, they tried to use the data post factor to develop a model and then uh, they were able to do uh, a rank correlation of 0.19, but again, that's not real time, real life. So that's where uh, we are in terms of some of the studies I'm aware of in terms of where a stress assessment stands. So why? What are the major roadblocks in getting a, a stress assessment to work reliably in the field? So I can come up with four reasons, again, based on what the literature uh, from says, as well as what we have found out. First one is wide between person differences. Wide between person differences in both physiology and self-report. So meaning that the physiology shows wide variability between different people. Every person is unique and it's shown exhibited in their physiology. Then when, uh, what issues or what events makes somebody how stressed that is different and for the same amount of stress that they feel what they report is also different so so therefore there are many sources of wide between person variability and when we think about automated detection of stress we are trying to assess from physiological response what the person is saying and so there are these several layers, what the physiology exhibits and uh, I mean, how specific it is, and then how specific it is from all the other confounds that happen. And then to find a population scale model that is able to map this physiological response to psychological uh, uh, perception and then self-report. The second issue is that physiological arousal occurs in both extreme ends of the balance axis. So when we are excited and when we are stressed, in both cases, physiological arousal is, occurs. Now being able uh, to distinguish among them is not easy. Now, suppose we are a fan watching a game 
our team lost versus our team won. One is exuberance, the other is the stress. In both cases, we'll see physiological arousal. If we are engaged in a work deeply, we're really enjoying the work versus we are overloaded with work. They both will lead to physiological arousal. If we are meeting, trying to meet a deadline, submit a paper or a grant proposal or uh, take an exam. And afterwards, we keep worrying about what's going to happen. So in the first case, it is productive stress helps us do well in the exam. Second case, it's unproductive stress because we are worrying and that's no, no amount of worrying is going to change what grade we are going to get. So then there is a stress due to physical exertion, which will show in physiology, but and stressed during physical exertion, as happened with the zebra and lion, they are both running and they're both stressed. And so being able to tease that apart is also challenging. The third issue is the temporal discrepancy. Whenever stress occurs, if and if physiology is uh, exhibits that stress response, physiology returns to baseline pretty soon or very close to baseline pretty soon in the order of minutes. But if you uh, look at the people's self-report, or I mean, as uh, that's the way we have to assess the perception, then it takes hours. So we are talking about this temporal discrepancy of minutes versus hours in terms of recovery. So when we get a self-report and we get a stress response in physiology, physiology, which physiological measurements corresponds to the self-report that shows the person is stressed? Is it the two minutes before the self-report? Is it 10 minutes before the self-report? Is it an hour before the self-report? When did the stress event occur? That's when we would find the signature in physiology if that stress event did arouse physiology. And so that mapping is much harder to do because of this temporal discrepancy. And as you can see in this recovery of self-rating, uh, th there is again wide variability for different events. I mean, if suppose something happened, like you heard a loud bang on the door, and then you are loud bang outside, you open the door and, and found out that, okay, something had fell and everything is all right, even your perception is going to recover soon. But if something really bad happened, that's going to affect you for hours. So the fourth challenge, I think, is lack of large data. So when it comes to computer vision or other advances that, I mean, uh, other major advances in AI, they have benefited from large data sets, large real life data sets. So, <clears throat> but when, and, uh, so when it comes to uh, sensor data from wearables, that uh, there are some larger data sets, but uh, I mean, where it's possible to have a uh, labeling or uh, unambiguous labeling are, events that we can observe and multiple people looking at the same event will all agree that yes, it's that event. So if somebody is smoking, they can all see that yes, the, I mean, the smoking is occurring or walking or eating, any of these effects. But when it is about stress, if we have the data, it's very hard to be able to, for anybody else to post factual label. So, and I mean, by looking at the data, the data exhibits many kinds of responses. And what I show here are some snippets of PPG data collected in real life in one of the studies we did. And what the labels you see is what participants reported corresponding to those data. So we need something like ImageNet for, uh, to make major advances in pushing the boundary for stress, automated detection of stress. So what I mean, so I want to just capture our journey for stress detection uh, in really one slide. So we have we started working on this problem way back in 2007 when we had this AutoSense grant from Genes Environment and Health Initiative that was launched at NIH. It was a major initiative that really uh, from kick started this M Health field to the I mean, at least for me. So by 2011, we have our colleague Emre Ertin def, uh, well, uh, designed this wireless wearable system called AutoSense that was able to collect several measurements, ECG, respiration, temperature, and so on uh, from, at the chest level. 
using the data that we were able to collect from both lab and the field, we developed uh, at first a stress model and came up with several ideas that helped show the feasibility of being able to assess the stress. Then it took about four more years to uh, come up with something that was uh, automated. So the one in 2011, we were able to select a specific segments of data and be able to run the model. And what CSTRESS did was that it had all the signal processing and screening and modeling in place that didn't require babysitting by any individual. So therefore the CSTRESS model, we were able to implement it on a smartphone to run in real time. And several studies were conducted uh, where, I mean, for smoking cessation, for stress, for behavior change, where the stress was detected in real time and used to prompt the individual for uh, I mean, uh, either to provide self-report or for interventions. This worked well for uh, research studies because we, I mean, we, we were able to compensate enough to participants that they were, they, were, they were willing to wear this chest belt and the ECG electrodes for about up to four weeks in, in, in the field. But this, uh, this could not be translated into real life, real usage. So then for the next five years, we worked in translating our stress model to work on the PPG data. That means that that can be collected conveniently on the wrist, wrist uh, water devices. And then we also began working on identifying which, uh, what the stressor is if the, if, it's, if, if the sensor detects a person to be stressed. So after that, uh, it was possible to deploy this in larger scale and then go on a journey to see how well could we detect stress in real life as compared to, I mean, asking people to say yes or no, or I mean, provide their labels. And that was this MOODS study that uh, I mean, was launched in 2022 or late 2021, and it just finished earlier this year. <clears throat> So the MOODS study, it's, called, um, it's for mobile open observation of daily stressors. Uh, this was a remote study where we uh, <clears throat> we recruited about 122 participants. We asked them to wear a fossil smartwatch for about 100 days out there in the natural field environment. And this watch uh, had, uh, they, they were given instructions to install the Wear OS uh, app that we had developed that detected Event, stressful events in real time or physiological events and assessed uh, how likely they were to be stressed. They also had a smartphone app and whenever an event was detected, some of these events were sent to on the smartphone for the participants to rate uh, uh, with respect to, uh, but this time rather than asking them, how are you feeling right now? What we asked them is we showed them a segment of time when the system detected an event, and we asked them during this, from this time to this time, uh, what was your stress level? And if they mentioned that it was likely stressful, then we asked them to describe as to why. So we asked them to log their stressors. And at any point, they had the ability to go back to the, uh, to the dashboard of, on their smartphone and uh, provide this uh, editing, uh, edit the labels that they provided. And uh, so we did not provide any incentives to the participants. So no cash incentive of any kind whatsoever throughout the entire study, neither during the study, nor at the end of the study. But what we provided them instead was visualizations of their own data each at the end of each week. And so this study went on for 14 weeks. So we provided them about 16 different visualizations each week. We are, uh, I mean, we, we are in the process of sanitizing this data and then uh, we'll, we'll report as to what we have found so far. Uh, this, uh, and we are, our hope is that uh, at some time in the near future, we can open up this data set for the community to be able to model stress or improve the modeling of the stress and stressors in the real life environment. So, <clears throat> So then next question uh, I want to discuss is, so is a stress detection ready for prime time as activity detection, detections were considered to be when they first appeared in wearable commercial devices? 
So we talked about as to what kind of assessments we need. Uh, do, I don't know if we are there or not with respect to the commercial devices, but there are several commercial devices that now do exist with real-time stress detection uh, out there. So here I have three devices. One is uh, Fitbit Sense 2, the other is, uh, next one is Hoop, and third one is Garmin. And each of them, they do have, uh, uh, so Fitbit calls them body response, and Hoop has a stress monitor, and Garmin has this stress detection in real time. And you, uh, I mean, anybody should be able to use it today to the best of my knowledge. I have not personally used them, but, uh, but they do exist. So, <clears throat> so assuming that uh, these, these work, if a stress detection works on wearables, how, I mean, what various utilities can we make out of it? First one, we each of, stress is not a foreign concept. Stress affects uh, perhaps each of us. And so we can think of it as, a, how does it help me as an individual? So does, can it help each of us or any of us with a stress management? That's first question. Second question is, can we, you, given its impact in, on so many disease outcomes, can we use it in research studies? Can we use it in stress-related EMAs to um, trigger ecological momentary assessments in observational studies? Can we use it to trigger ecological momentary interventions in trials, whether micro-randomized trials or RCTs, randomized control trials? So that's what I want to discuss next. So the first one is, when we look at the news, there is a lot of discussion about stress. Uh, this is a recent, I guess, just a pick from today, right? Workplace absences at 10 year high with stress, the major cause of long-term sickness. Now, uh, I mean, when I, uh, I've been writing about stress in our papers and each time we write, we cite a lot of statistics in there. And so the same with news. Uh, so in this case, they, uh, I mean, they did, collected data from 900 companies that employ 6.5 million staff. And so they had large enough data set to figure out that uh, there has been a pretty major change in terms of number of days lost due to the stress. They've, the, they've found that 76% of the respondents had been off work due to stress over the past year. Another study, uh, again, very recent, uh, this was the 18-year prospective cohort study, and they looked at coronary heart disease risk. Uh, and uh, what they found is that those who had, uh, who had job strain and effort reward imbalance, uh, they, uh, I mean, either of the two, they had about 50% higher chance of experiencing a coronary heart disease event. And those who had both, for them, the risk was double. So when we read any of this news or when we write about it as a scientist, we feel like, yeah, it, it, it is there, out there, not to me. So I'm good, it does affect somebody else. And there are enough people to whom it has an impact, okay? So, 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 so there's some more stat. I mean, uh, so in here, uh, I mean, there was a study done with about 30,000 people. They're followed for eight years. And so they had about uh, of, 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 uh, several deaths that they tracked. And they found out that those who experienced a lot of stress in the previous year had a 43% increased risk of dying. And then they say it was only true for the people who also believed that the stress was harmful for their health. But the first step that they describe is acknowledging stress when you experience it. If we deny that stress does not affect me. I only work on stress. I mean, I'm largely talking about myself because that has been my experience. I largely work on stress because it will benefit lots of people, lots of other people, okay? So, <clears throat> so the first step is how do we acknowledge stress when, you, when we experience it? Uh, so, uh, so I can just share my personal anecdote, okay? Uh, I have a job that, I mean, this is the best job on earth that anyone can get. That's how I think of the job. I really love what I do, have a loving family, right? Have, I mean, I do, I mean, nobody tells me what to do. So I, I largely think that I really don't have any stress in my life. 
or whatever stress, it's my own own doing. So meaning that I don't have the effort reward imbalance. I don't have the not lack of recognition. So why, I mean, why would I need any, any uh, why would uh, I have any reason to, uh, uh, to monitor my stress, okay? But we should do something about the stress because it's going to help somebody else. So, so at the start of the call, Deepak asked me of, uh, what, uh, whether we have commercialized something. So we conducted the Moore's study. And in the Moore's study, what we found out is that uh, just by monitoring their stress and the stressors, the participants reported about 10% reduction in stress. And many of the studies that provide active interventions, they find almost zero change in pre versus post stress for the, I mean, throughout the study. And this was a three month long study. So saw that, but uh, this was only, this study involved only those people who are actively interested in, in the stress. So, I mean, here, me again, as a scientist, Okay, I mean, I have no, no much, uh, not much stress in my life. So this, uh, but I, I realized that because there are so many people who can benefit from it, I think the, uh, any research study can only involve so many people, and it has to end at, after after its enrollment quota is met. And so the Bursa study also had to end. But there are so many people who want who would benefit from this kind of technology. So, and the only way to do that is by uh, by it releasing it in a commercial world. So, so we do, we took that Moods technology and uh, developed an app for smartwatches. It's called Q's Hub. I mean, a company is called Q's Hub, and the app is called Stress Alerts. It's available for Fossil and uh, for Samsung Galaxy smartwatches. It's an app freely available. But I personally, uh, we released it very recently. But I, as a person, uh, alpha user, have been using it for the past three four months. So before I started using it, my thing was, uh, I'm, you know, I, I just want to test it, but I don't think I have a stress. So for a few days, I mean, not much happened. And, and then there were days when I was doing something, sometimes booking airline tickets, sometimes working on things that I was falling behind. That means I had promised to somebody that I would turn it over by such and such date and was past that date. And so I asked and, uh, or a paper that is due and should have been sent to the co-authors two days ago and still, and so, uh, and then there were days when I was working on the pa same paper, but this time not, uh, I mean, under that deadline. And I could begin to see the stress cost of what I do on a daily basis. And so I began to realize, okay, I, I was in this denial mode that no, I don't need stress monitoring in my life. But when you begin to experience it, you, you realize, oh, so, uh, really, I, I, I didn't realize it. And so we have had several other alpha users so far who have had a similar uh, experience that, oh, I didn't think I, I needed it, but after I tried it, oh, there was this moment, and then there was this moment, and so on. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, I mean, most, uh, I mean, when we see those stats or those news, we don't believe that we belong there. That start involves somebody else, not me. And so, uh, and so that's that has been my my personal realization on the I mean, very uh, I mean, uh, short journey so far that we have had in trying to have uh, people freely use a, a stress monitoring system. So if Anybody gets curious as to what it can do for you? It's very simple to install. You can, I mean, if you have a Samsung Galaxy watch or a Fossil smartwatch, and open the Play Store on your watch, search for Q's Hub, install this app, open the app, grant permissions, and that's it. So we, it doesn't ask for any any personal information uh, because we don't want anybody's the data to be connected to any identifying information. But so so wanted to uh, share that, that that because many times as a scientist I have been guilty of just thinking that it's not for me. So then in research for research studies, so as we looked uh, for the research studies, the stress is so pervasive, it has it has so much impact that has been established in science. So I mean, if a technology works for stress, it can be used not only in those research studies that are directly on stress, but in research studies that are throughout for many of these chronic diseases. And then as Ben mentioned at the start of the talk, 
for among among caregivers. So, so but I mean I want to also be realistic. Can stress detection replace self reports? And that's what has been the wish of some uh, researchers. Okay, I don't have to ask the participants. Can we just do automated stress detection? My experience is stress detection is not perfect, and I do not believe that it can ever be perfect. So, I mean, the alpha score consistency among self-report items is itself around 0.8. So how can we get, uh, I mean, the detection accuracy for a stress that is 100% or close to 100%? So that's not going to happen. So the so best, I think, is to combine the stress detection with self-reports, with both EMAs and EMIs. But what is the best way to do so can now be investigated now that there are some systems that exist for a stress detection. And uh, there is another part, which is the science for intervention during stress. So, so far we haven't had very many ways to detect stress in real time. And so the interventions for stress have usually consisted of kind of exercises that do this to improve your resilience and it will help you when the stressful moment arrives. But when people are stressed, they don't have a lot of attention span. Is there something that can be done to, to uh, I mean, that is more likely to work in the right moment? Uh, I mean, can we de-escalate stressful situations? So there has been some science developed, uh, in, this, in particular what I'm listing here is from James Gross, uh, this is something he calls ex extended process model. Uh, I mean, so, but that has been tested in the lab settings. Now, when we go out in the field, the, the situation becomes quite different. But I think in stress research or stress intervention research, we can begin to embark on this journey. Okay. So, so there are lots of opportunities for, uh, for I mean, uh, to do future uh, research in this area. Uh, I mean, how to detect the start and end of a stress episode. How do we validate it, actually, is even more interesting question. How do we detect a stress for every user? Because there is so much user between user variability. Remember I said in one of the field studies that the F1 score of 0.66 only for 18% of the users. But every person's stress matters, and their life matters. So how to detect a stress episode despite this varying intensity of arousal when there is concurrent physical activity? And then uh, stress is not something where there is one intervention that works for everything. A stress happens due to lots of different reasons. In the MOODS study, we asked participants to log their stressors. We provided them with a drop-down list of 80 stressors we found in literature so far. So they could just I mean, uh, uh, select one of those 80, I mean, as they typed it, the list populated and they, they, it will require them less time. But they took the time and effort to report 1,500 different stressors. So the diversity in terms of what the various sources of stress are in people's lives is quite different. And so I think we also need to move towards identifying stressors because not every stressor is something where we need an intervention, but we need to be able to categorize them appropriately so that we know when is a stress intervention needed and when it's not needed. So those are the thoughts I had uh, to share today. I would be happy to have a conversation. Thank you. Great, thank you, Santosh. Um, so we've got uh, time for questions. Um, it looks like there are a couple in the chat. So let's start there. Uh, the folks who have additional questions, um, don't, don't worry about typing them into the chat. Um, we can just uh, put your hand up and jump into the discussion. So let's, um, I'm going to start with uh, Jason. Jason, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, sure. So uh, thanks, Santosh. I was just thinking about folks um, who have kind of underlying constant environmental stress. Um, let's say they're, you know, facing poverty and they're stressed about paying the rent and maybe they have some sort of hypervigilance left over from past traumas. Is there I mean, what can we learn about those folks using these technologies? So it's about, uh, I mean, uh, so there are two things. What can we learn and what can they learn? And both are important. So what we have learned from the Moore's study is that they can learn a lot about their own stressors if they have a way to be able to log 
easily as to what stresses them out. What can we learn is that if if they I mean if they find find that this is useful, sometimes they can come up with ways to deal with it, and that's what we saw in the Moose study. But there are many other times when they need assistance, when it's either beyond their capacity or beyond their control. And those are the times when they need assistance outside of themselves. And those are the things where scientists or employers or external entities can step in. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there's there's a follow-up from um, Shivanji and along a similar direction, I had a similar question as well. So just thinking about the, the context that Jason was implying, the sort of the thing about the AD caregiver um, setting, maybe where folks are experiencing either chronic stress or you know, significant acute episodic uh, stress, whether you know you saw folks that looked like that, maybe in the mood study or in other studies, um, and then how how different it looks, I guess, at the signal level or in terms of the response level. I can imagine at some point for some people, the problem would flip from sort of you know stress being the minority class with a with a sparse events to the stress condition being sort of the norm for people, um, and trying to find periods of relative um, you know low stress um, would be the difficult detection problem. So do you have any other comments along those lines about? Maybe for folks that are under higher stress situations, what that would look like and what you've seen in the data you've collected so far? Yeah, that's a very good question. So I don't know as to how the data will look different because the data looks different regardless of everything. So now, but there is this question of habituation. Uh, there is this question of interoception. So, I mean, those people are, uh, I mean, like the stress, you can call it some form of stress disorders meaning that it happened so much, so many times, and neither I can do something about it and nobody else has done anything about it. I am going to ignore it. And that's, though, though, that becomes problematic physiologically and psychologically for those people. Having a system like what I, what I was describing can help them regain that awareness. And that awareness greatly helps, I think, to connect it back. I have no science to back it up, but that's what my observation was. I mean, looking at the data from the MOOC system. Okay, thank you. Um, I think Julie had another question about variability. Julie, do you wanna jump in? Sure, um, yeah, basically it was kind of building off some of the other ones and um, it was, you know, we've been learning a bit more about stress and hypertension, how that kind of differs for black individuals, for example. Just wondering the extent to which you, the, like the sample that you've included and, and kind of your thoughts about kind of racial and ethnic diversity in the sample and measuring stress and also gender um, for that, for what that's worth. Yeah, so I think, I mean, uh, the smallest, I would call the study, we did a small study. I mean, just 122 people is not a lot, uh, but it did include uh, I mean, both racial diversity and, the, and gender wise, it was about balanced. Uh, I mean, we are in the city of Memphis, so here, I mean, we do get sufficient uh, diversity with respect to uh, I mean, different ethnicities. I don't have the numbers right in front of me to be able to say. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a yeah another follow up again similar along similar lines. So for this for this audience specifically, I think interest in the use of the you know potential use of these technologies by older adults is something that's of interest. So do you happen to know sort of what the age distribution for moods look like? I mean, yeah, so, from older folks. Yeah. yeah, so it it did have a wide age distribution. So it did include both young, uh, young and and, and uh, more uh, senior people. I, I I don't believe it it included anybody uh, who would be eighty plus or so, but it did have several fifties uh, and sixties. Thank you. Um, Natish has his hand. Natish, go ahead. Actually, Misha, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for noticing. So nice talk, Santosh, I loved it. Thank you. Um, but you will hear something, a question that relates to what we talked about 10 years ago. <laughs> um, the individual differences of the stress response and the stress yes. effect yes. are tremendous in, in this. And that's why you, variability is so high. Yes. So I was wondering if you guys considered modeling the stress response and stress consequences for individuals? So um, uh, we haven't, uh, I would say, uh, developed any models. Uh, for that purpose, we need you, Misha. Uh, for, uh, uh, you are, the, you are uh, the modeling expert, I know. 
but uh, for the but we did use the linear language uh, sorry uh, li linear mixed models uh, I mean for to to uh, assess I mean uh, when participants reported that they had decreasing stress to be able to see as to I mean whether uh, despite individual variability was there still a uh, I mean, reported decre decreasing trend in stress and that was true but the between person differences the random effects was significant and so that that means it was affected significantly by by the between person variability so that's the extent of the between person modeling we have done so far thank you mm -hmm. yeah, thank you uh Santosh, amazing Thank you for sharing that work. Just fascinating. Um, so one comment and one question. So comment, you're just building on this idea of heterogeneity between people, the sort of physiologic implications of stress uh, and the argument you make, which I, I which I buy very strongly that the, the pathway to stress through cardiovascular disease or cardiometabolic disease, those individuals may have a very different physiologic manifestation of stress, um, not only because of their own innate you know, biological systems and or the implications of disease, but also the medications that they're on. Um, and so just to sort of call out and maybe provoke um, a, a broader line of inquiry into people with specific disease subsets. Um, the question, if you'd like to comment on that, would be awesome if you could, but this, the, the real question was about interventions. Uh, and, um, and, you know, Misha's question for, you know, sort of sets this out. And and I think you make a very good case, Santosh, that, you know, um, feedback to individuals for self-diagnosis and self-management, there's a lot there, but that involves a relatively um, activated and able um, uh, body of individuals. People are perhaps like us um, who are motivated and have the cognitive uh, processing ability to do this. Um, and so it, this, you know, I, I know this is a, something we'll be talking about in a few weeks time, but just in time adaptive interventions around stress reduction techniques Notwithstanding the measurement issues, you know, it's um, this to me is sort of where the future of this may be. And I'm just curious if you could just speak a little bit about whether or not anyone's playing in that space and what it might look like. Yeah, I, I, I mean, both very good thoughts, uh, Nitish. Uh, for the first one, uh, as you mentioned about the those who are on medications, uh, uh, I believe that there is hope, but it needs to be studied. Uh, the the reason for hope is that many of I mean these modelings they are all personalized, so meaning that it's about being able to figure out what's I mean it they are they are acting as their own control. So it's about when they are out of the their own respective bounds, uh, not so much about the populations. Yeah, although the delta just to to respond. So for example, I'm on a beta blocker, for example, which is going to change my adrenergic response. To all yes. kinds of things. If heart rate or heart rate variability are predictors of stress response, you know, yes, it's me within me, but then the amount of variability is 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 right. much smaller. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So so I think it it will be fascinating to study this and to see as to whether the current personalization techniques how effective they are and how uh, how much uh, I mean what improvements need to be made so that it works for those individuals because they are one of the most needy individuals. So, so that's the first one. Second, I think you, as you talked about the just-in-time adaptive interventions, I wholeheartedly agree that now with the advent of this technology, I mean, today it's not widespread mm -hmm. and therefore it may not seem to us like big, but in 10 years, a time. Uh, I mean, that, that's when you. I mean, if we see this widespread, then we will realize, okay, that was the time when we should have started. So I think time is right now to begin to develop the science around as to what kind of interventions can help those individuals, both who are who have the cognitive ability to and capacity to engage in their own diagnosis, as well as those who don't. Because for both of them, this capability hasn't existed in the past. Now that it exists, how best can it be used to improve their health and well-being? So, I have a quick question. This is a great talk, by the way. It's been a few years since I heard you, and I think it's great to see all the new stuff. So, just uh, I'm curious what. Um, what the accuracy of stress uh, detection looks like over different time scales. So, I mean, does the in the moment just individual stress 
detection versus half a day, a few hours, an entire day. Because I imagine even if you're not there, quite there in terms of detecting an individual instance of stress, you know, certain interventions may not depend on that. Right? And they, it may be possible to apply as long as you're stratifying reasonably with high, medium, low stress, maybe it's possible to apply certain types of interventions. So where does that stand? Uh, so uh, my honest answer is, I don't know. <laughs> because I mean, when we say accuracy with respect to what? Okay, uh, I mean, so meaning with respect to, if, if we're talking about self-report, if you, uh, I mean, uh, rise up and say, oh, at the level of the day, we don't need any, any system like this. You can just use self-report, right? You can use some EMAs a couple of times in the day and then you will have, have that system. So the, the, the true value of systems like this is in the moment. And that means being able to know in the moment if the individual is going through something. And if that, if, if you know about it, then what, if, and when something should be done about it. So that's what I think is, uh, I mean, about it, but I perhaps didn't uh, I mean, uh, interpret your questions correctly. So when you, uh, can you try again? Uh, no, even, you know, even a lot of the, you know, behavioral therapies or interventions are not necessarily intended to uh, alleviate stress in the moment, right? They're, alle they're alleviating stress overall. Um, many of the mindfulness therapies, many of, many of these therapies are intended to overall reduce stress as opposed to just, I mean, there's an in, in the moment, if you're panicking and that there's that, but uh, the, the therapies don't necessarily work in an in the moment manner. So th mean? that's one side of it, um, that there are certain things one, one can do uh, and so even the journaling aspect, maybe, you know, that, that's, I, that's, I don't know, that, that, that's, I'm not so sure, but I imagine that even uh, letting people know that the overall stress has increased by so much in a day uh, is useful to, you know, to allow them to zoom in further and actually observe themselves over the span of a day and see what's happening, right? So might be useful in that context as well. Yeah, so I think some of these technologies like the Garmin or Samsung or I mean, the, I mean, the Hoop, and they all have uh, features like this that try to give you a sense of how your day has been with respect to stress. Again, how accurate they are, I don't know. But the, I mean, I would expect that over time they will, become, they will get better and better. So in terms of therapy that exists today, yes, and these therapies are still going to be there. The I think the new opportunity is to also do something about momentary so that it can complement the therapy, the, the therapies that exist today. Right, very good. I think we're just at time. So thank you again, uh, Santosh, for speaking today. We really appreciate it. Um, and we hope to see uh, everyone who's on at the next webinar. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.